Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lukes, and I'm one of the moderators for uh, today. I'll go ahead and jump over to some slides real quick. But first thing we want to do is uh, say welcome to uh, all of our uh, EdCamp Global people who are attending. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, basically, what we're looking at here is the. Uh, this is also welcome to our Metagame Book Club members who are re returning for uh, the second week. Uh, as always, we want to thank the Games and Simulations Network from ISTE uh, for helping organize and collaborate with this, as well as the Inevitable Betrayal Guild uh, from World of Warcraft. So we'll go ahead and quickly go through our panelists. So starting from uh, left to right at the bottom of the screen, we have uh, Tanya, otherwise known as Grid. Wave. <laughs> and we have Kay and Sherry. And Trish. So uh, the other thing is is that for the for the book club, for those of you that are new to the book club, really what we do is we pick a book. We have done about three of these a year, and uh, the expectation is that everyone has read the book and the materials, and they're coming to this discussion uh, ready to discuss and ready to look at stuff uh, and play the games. While uh, each week uh, you are allowed to lurk, we do uh, realize uh, that lurking is learning. And that uh, the other thing about it is that this is completely virtual. So everything that goes on in this book club is asynchronous. So we use a Google Plus community. Uh, we go ahead and use tools like Twitter as well as Hangout to uh, basically uh, give everyone uh, an update or let people participate live if they want to, or they can go ahead and just do it asynchronously online. So uh, one of the things we're going to start going through now is just do a quick overview of the websites. And so the first thing we'll do is we're going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Sherry, talk about uh, game studies, and uh, also then we'll also talk about the first book book club we did, which is uh, game studies as well as for the win by Corey Dockrow. Okay, thank Chris. So again, I am Sherry Jones, um, and I am the Track One facilitator um, for the Medicaid Book Club, and primarily what I focus on is game studies, and game studies is the study of games. Okay, so it's the focus of what games are all about, the meaning of games, what games can do, for example, through different lenses such as psychology, sociology, rhetoric, um, uh, argumentation, philosophy, all sorts, okay, even uh, physics or biology, okay? So you're trying to understand what games are doing. Now why is game studies important? Well, for our Metagame Book Club, we've been trying to invite educators to come along with us and try out game-based learning or gamification. But some educators might be questioning, well, what is what are the benefits of games? Why do we bother with them? What are they doing? What's happening at games when we're using them? So game studies allow us to focus on the subject of study, which is games. So we're just trying to figure out what that is about. Now, on the site itself, okay. so we have several tracks, um, well, not several tracks, but several sessions <laughs> of our uh, book club. And during the summer of 2014, um, we talked about the history of game studies. So we talk about such thing as a magic circle. So it's a, it's a place where players are together playing and pretending that the game situation is real so that the play can uh, resume. Um, also, we talked about such thing as the narratology versus ludology debate. We talked about what exactly is reality, what exactly are the cultural and social dimensions of games. That's what we covered in summer 2014. And fall, we went into talking about bigger topics that are very relevant at the time, which is about the gamer identity and representation of gender and race in games. Obviously, we heard of certain issues <laughs> surrounding gameplay. Um, particularly with gender and race um, in recent months. Okay, We also talk about ideologies as actually present in games. Most people do not think about ideology when they look at games, even though games are, are fun and free to play, um, they do speak ideas to us. They do present concept, even if it's implicitly. Okay, So we study about that. We also went into the discussion between game-based learning and gamified learning. And this last spring, what we did was we focused on interactive fiction and education. So interactive fiction 
is a creation of a branching narrative using digital medium, okay, in terms of digital medium. And what you do is you allow the player to play through a narrative and offer them several choices, and the choices that they make alters the consequence of their gameplay, okay? That has great relevance to education because interactive fiction games are easy to create both for teachers and for students, okay? So I think for my part here, I might have to pass it back to Chris, unless you have questions for me. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Uh, so the other, the book we paired, so uh, as you've seen with the, uh, on the website there, we have two tracks. So we have track one and track two. Uh, Sherry's always track one unless she decides she wants a vacation. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> on track two, you have basically the rest of the panelists here, uh, as, as well as uh, Christina uh, Tonis, who uh, unfortunately could not make it today, uh, but she's there as well. And uh, so really, for the first book club, why did we choose For the Win by Cory Doctorow? Um, the real reason why we're looking at it is we're just starting going ahead and getting started. And uh, we're looking for a young adult title uh, that covered games, specifically uh, MMOs, which is what a lot of us have experiences with. Um, so all of us have, have background playing games, or whether they're mobile games, whether they're console games, whether they're online mo uh, you know, games. You know, basically, games come in all shapes and sizes. But really, we're looking for something that sort of showcased these massively multiplayer online games, or otherwise known as MMOs. And uh, For the Wind does a really good job of describing what it's like to play in an MMO. So Corey, uh, so Corey Doctorow did a really good job of, of capturing that. And he also did a good job of really highlighting the collaboration that's needed to be successful in these games. Uh, that book does a really good job of going into all the different collaborations. And what's interesting about uh, moving online in the MMOs today is basically when you log in, it's almost you're logging into a, a global environment. You have people from all around the world playing these games. Uh, so, so that's something that, that he does a good job of showing that multinational aspect of gaming. The other thing is, for me personally, um, I really look at uh, the specific business and economic frames because that's my area of uh, teaching is business and accounting as, as well as including economics in there. And so really what I like about, the, what, I really, what I really liked about the book is it really sort of showcased those, those frames, those epistemic frames within the games that uh, allow you to go ahead and use that as an instructor to sort of showcase that. So, um, and, and that's the thing, is that it also really highlighted the different ways that characters made money, both in-game currency and those games that could be converted, those currencies that could be converted legally into uh, real money or, or currency, uh, and it also showcased also the, how will say, the shady side of gaming or the, those things that would be against the terms of service, uh, where people are selling characters or doing different things like that, which, which isn't necessarily legal but does happen. Uh, so, so it does a good job of showing you a lot of the different uh, facets of gaming, and, uh, and and really sort of putting that in, in a in an interesting storyline uh, that runs it runs us through. So uh, next we're going to do is we're going to jump over to our second uh, iteration of the book club, and uh, that happened in uh, November 2014. And so this one here we should, we focused on gender in games as well as pairing Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Uh, with the rise of the horde, so we'll go back to Sherry to talk about uh, track one. Okay, thanks, Chris. So I think the consensus is we're going to look at um, some of the games, okay, that I presented from from track one. Okay, so I think Chris mentioned gender and games. And in this week, we have several references. For example, some of the famous games that we see gamer identity and also gender being discussed is the game Bioshock Infinite. Okay, Bioshock Infinite, um, if anyone played it, is obviously the third game from the Bioshock series. And there are some major discussion of what race is about and what does it mean to be a woman in that particular game. We also showed, let's see if I should do, okay. So we also show, for example, a version of uh, uh, Mario, or actually Donkey Kong, 
but the inversion of Donkey Kong, which is originally, it's always been Mario saving Peach. Um, but an educator, actually a father, recreated the game and turned it into Peach's Saves Mario to show his daughter what it would be like for a female hero rather than a male hero in this particular game because she wanted to see what it would feel like for the female to play the hero in this game. We also looked into a problem with race in the game Walking Dead, which is an example of an interactive fiction. Um, this particular game, the lead character is Lead Everett. We do not often get um, uh, African American or Black American being the lead hero in a particular game. So it was very interesting to go through the emotional um, journey that this character goes through. And also the fact that the decisions that you make alters what happens to Lee Everett in that game. Other games that we go through, let's see here. Okay. We also talk about, for example, Final Fantasy X and particularly about the wardrobe choices of the characters, okay? So some of the characters, um, particularly in Japanese, JRPG. JRPG represents Japanese role-playing games, okay, JRPGs. They tend to give characters scandally clad uh, clothing, okay? So females tend to wear very little, <laughs> and this particular author who is critiquing the wardrobe choices is forcing us to re-examine why games are presented that way, are game developers responsible for trying to present a more positive image of females and female characters, okay? Um, we also looked at, for example, um, we talked about, let's see, actually I'm going to switch to the interactive fiction. Okay. All right, and I think, okay, thank you. <laughs> Trying to make sure I'm screen sharing or screen sharing. Okay, so we have several games during week three of our interactive fiction, which happened between April 6th to 12th, okay? And we discuss many different games. There's different types, okay? The beginning of interactive fiction started with parcel-based games, which is you're actually typing verbs, words as commands into the screen and waiting for the computer to give you an output, give you feedback on your next direction. So some of the games that we played, for example, I think we played as a group uh, Galatia by Emily Short. Okay. And this is a wonderful game in that the author allows us to encounter Galatia, which is a mythical character. Okay, and this mythical character, usually we don't get to talk to her directly, but through this game we're able to talk to this creation and understand her inner journey, whereas through most mythology we do not get to do that. Okay, so this is a re-envision, re, uh, a new perspective on this character. Other games that we played, let me see here. Okay. Another game that we talked about was Photopedia by Adam Cad. Yeah, and Adam Cad right there, that's under the first parcel base game. So this Photopedia, right there in the second half, <laughs> right there. But anyway, Photopedia is a game where you go through space and time in different dimensions. And you're trying to figure out how these different stories are interrelated. So the game takes you through a journey through various worlds, or story worlds, if you will. Okay? These kind of stories teaches students particularly perspective. And for the people who are designing this kind of game, they're forced to think about what exactly does it mean to construct a narrative. How do we construct a narrative that's most conducive to understanding? Um, and also, what are the effects of narrative, whether it's psychologically or philosophically? What is it doing to the player? So we assign quite a bit of games. Other games underneath, 
Okay. We also talked about point and click, which is um, not parser based, which is you're actually typing text and getting some kind of feedback. But point and click is actually visual representation of games. So on the very top, we have a game called A Duck Has an Adventure. Okay. In that particular game, the author decided to draw frame by frame a story. So rather than telling you what the story is or that you're reading a text on the screen, you're looking at shot by shot of images. Um, and you're clicking on the images to understand what's going to happen next to this duck. And duck, the duck actually later becomes a pirate, he becomes a scholar, he becomes a drunk, he goes through all kinds of life variations, um, and it's very interesting to see what happens to the duck. Um, we also have another famous game, and I think that our current Metagame Book Club is, is addressing, is Gods Will Be Watching, okay? This is a survivor horror game, which is that the premise is you're stuck on the last days of Earth, um, the world is coming to a doom, and you have 40 days to last to try to survive. Okay, and you've got 40 days only, so you're making choices. You're trying to conserve uh, uh, food. You're trying to get water. You're trying to get fire going so that you can continue living. And it's very interesting to see the psychology between characters in that game. Okay, so these particular games as demonstration. Games are like novels. Games are stories, okay? And there are certain consequences we already know when we have children or adults reading stories, there are meaning that we derive from those books and stories. Same thing with games, there are narratives inside games, and there are certain consequences for us to play through those games. What does it mean when we are playing those games? Okay? And I think I'm going to pass it back to Chris or Kay. Hey everybody! Um, I see, I see that we have a we have a couple more people on here. So I want to say hello to everybody who just joined us and and give you kind of an idea of of what we're going ahead and doing. We are the Metagame Book Club. What we are is a group of educators, but we're also gamers. We're associated with the ISTE Games and Sim Network, and also a gaming guild called Inevitable Betrayal. So what we've been doing for the past year is we have been doing book clubs and we are on our fourth book club now. And when we say book club, um, it's actually a book club plus because we don't just, as you've been hearing from Sherry, we just don't read <laughs> the book. We read, we read about games, game studies, and then we also play the games. So every time that, that you're doing the book club, you're also getting a list of games to play. And depending on what we're reading, it might be a big list like, like Sherry's been going over with you, or it might just be like one to come and look at. Now, the, the thing about it is we know people, uh, we know they're, not everybody's a gamer. So a lot of times what we do is we, we, sh we, we live stream a game so people can get the idea of the game. And we've gone through what our first book and book club was. Now, our second book and book club, we had the two tracks. And Sherry looked at game study and um, gender and race on her track. And then on our other track, um, what we did was we looked at <laughs> Joseph Campbell and also one of the books written for World of Warcraft. And so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit um, about about why we chose Joseph Campbell. Now, the reason why we chose, uh, chose Joseph Campbell, the power of myth, is because a lot of teachers, when they were talking about, well, why are you having the student go in the game? Why are you having the student go in World of Warcraft? Why are they going in Guild Wars? Why are they going into any, and, and Grid is taking us through here right now, why are they going into any of these sword and board kind of games? Well, most people would say, oh, the hero's journey. And, and most people could get the reference hero's journey, but didn't actually, hasn't actually read the hero's journey. So what we did for this track was we had everybody, everybody read the hero's journey, and then we paired it up with one of the books from, from World of Warcraft. And I'll have Trish talk about that in a moment. But what the hero's journey really is, 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 is one um, narrative theory about 
how a hero goes from from being chosen to going on the quest and then coming back to the community after the quest is done. So we wanted to discuss that because if you decided to use this kind of game in your classroom, you could pair it up with the reading of the hero's journey. And this was actually done. Um, this was actually done out in Arizona. And um, there, there was a married couple, um, Kim and Dave Flack, and they did it for for Dave's English class. And this, they, it was actually junior high. And Kim worked for the PBS station. So the hero's journey and the whole interview with Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers, they paired it with that, so the parents could actually watch the the interview with that while the students were playing World of Warcraft and also reading the hero, hero's journey and learning the passages and it was just great because you could see on their blog the students would just be going well in the hero's journey and being able to cite straight out of that book exactly what they were doing in World of Warcraft so that was one example of a pairing now um, I'm going to turn it over to Trish, so so Trish can can explain why we chose um, Rise of the Horde to go with it too. All right, we've been playing World of Warcraft together as a guild of educators for several years now, and when you go in the game, you know there are these central characters. There. They're usually non-playing characters, NPCs, but you know they have an important role in the, the story of the game because if you just go into World of Warcraft, there is this whole antagonistic struggle between the Horde and Alliance. I think that's a nice way to put it, but there's this whole struggle there and if you don't know what's going on you kind of wonder how did we get here rise of the horde takes you back to the very beginnings of the lore of world of warcraft and it gives you the background story and the history of how everything got to where it is and surprisingly enough very well written books but it also puts you in a place that it completely changes your view of the virtual environment that you're in because you go from you're just a person in a game running around completing quests to where you really feel like you're part of the story and you get all kind of fangirl when you start seeing the central characters of the book where you see Thrall or um, uh, Varian Wren or uh, Tyrandy Whisperwind, whenever you see any of these characters that are the main characters from the lore, you just get all excited because you're like, oh, I remember when this happened in the book. And it's actually seeing a book come to life for you. And it is really just takes your gameplay to another level and um, just really kind of embeds you in the whole it really takes it to that third person fantasy that you are involved in and and like we said that we we live streamed and this is what um Tanya is right now here in the in the garrison and so so Tanya do you want to run us around the garrison and show us a little bit and show us some of those npcs even and sorry, NPCs, non-player characters that that are waiting for you. And while we were reading the book, we were we were seeing we were able to, as Trish said, able to go in and look at those characters. Okay, so here, um, and I can say that as I'm reading this, the actually the first book that we read, or you know, the, every book that we've read, it really does make a difference when you are playing a game, what whatever the game is. It it kind of helped me to understand um, and the one that we're reading now very very much so makes a difference so here we are in, in in the garrison and I went to the tower just so you could get the view from afar and this particular garrison belongs to each individual player so you don't typically run into other people from uh, the game other live people unless you invite them to the game and I'm just going to jump off here because I don't feel like taking the stairs 
Okay, and here we are in the garrison. And this garrison is, everyone has one. I, I, you know, in the game when they talk about instances and, and many of one thing as they go looking for the key, I kind of thought about the garrison because here we are in the garrison and everyone that plays the game that is in this phase has a garrison just like this. So when we visit each other's garrison, we always kind of comment about what they've done with the place because they all look the same, um, you know, with a few minor variations. So here is the, these are professional shacks in the garrison where we make things and some other ancillary buildings. All of the characters that you see here are NPCs or non-player characters. So these little guys are walking around. I can go up and talk to Tormach here. He's one of my followers, but he's a computerized character. He's not a human. So he's programmed to follow me or to do what I ask him to do. Um, and I, I guess I could like zip over to my favorite place in the garrison. Well, this is the, the, the main building of the garrison, the flight point, so I can take flights to other places in Azeroth. And my most favorite place in my garrison is over here, the pet menagerie. And here's my little pets. And I don't want to take too long, but there's my garrison. I, <laughs> I know, but, but it helps demonstrate this. And while this is just kind of a demo thing for, for people watching for Ed Camp and for also our people in the Meta Book and again, book club. Um, we, you see, we would spend more time. We would spend more time here in a, le a regular live stream because the book we're currently reading, Ready Player One, talks about how the main character keeps talking to his AI, and and he, that his AI is keeping him company and things like that. So. So where Grid just showed you the pets, if this was our normal book club, we'd spend more time talking about how how something virtual and how AI can actually <laughs> you know, keep you company. Okay, so now we're going to turn back to Sherry, and we're going to tell you about our third um, the third book club we just finished up this spring, and it was Interactive Fiction and Lee Sheldon's Multiplayer Classroom. Okay. Thanks, Kay. Um, so what we're doing for the interactive fiction, particularly the practice of interactive fiction, is that, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very easy access for most, um, uh, both teachers and students. And we've seen some teachers experiment with using interactive fiction in the classroom. It is not just limited, though, to, for example, English courses, because I primarily teach philosophy, and I have gotten my entire philosophy class to make interactive fiction games. Um, I also currently teach a game design and psychology course. And for my students, what they're doing with um, um, interactive fiction is that they're using it as a storyboard. So instead of just drawing images as storyboarding, what they're doing is they're testing the logic of their game design by recreating it inside interactive fiction medium. And once we play through the interactive fiction medium, then they actually start drawing. They decide whether they're going to do low fidelity or high fidelity art. They're thinking about the psychology of what the characters are doing, how the how the player will react to certain objects, certain colors, certain shapes inside the game, and so forth. So there's many different applications to interactive fiction. Um, going back to what my philosophy students are doing as well. Um, when we talk about philosophy, we are talking about reasoning. Okay, how does one, uh, how does a, a argumenter or a rhetor start from point A and get to point F? Okay, there are several processes or several reasons that you use to build up to your argument. So what the students are doing is actually creating interactive fiction games, which ask the player to make moral decisions, okay, or to make logic decisions and see what happens based on the reasoning that they've selected, okay? So that's a very easy way for students to test out whether or not they agree with a philosopher or they agree with another philosopher and if 
For example, if we um, use a real philosophical theory and apply to reality, what would the reality look like? So we've seen this kind of thing going on in the movie world. For example, fa famous example is The Matrix, right? Um, they took they took a lot of philosophical ideas and placed it in a movie, you know, movie scenario. So what we're trying to get the students to do is to say, you don't just have to watch a movie anymore, and you don't just have to play a game anymore. You can actually construct your own game world, okay, your own game narrative, using something like interactive fiction to test out those theories um, that you're so interested in, okay. And yes, um, how we kill baby animals, yes. <laughs> and the morality of killing baby animals, yes. That would be something that students can test out as well, okay? Um, there's other games, for example, on, our, on the site, I did put a ton of games, um, but this is not the inclusive list because there's thousands and thousands of interactive fiction created by fans of this medium. Um, and some of it, for example, one of my favorite ones in the point-and-click games is called Pure Again. So that's under the point-and-click section. Pure Again is uh, Pure Again is created by Kevin McGowan, and it's a game that allows the player to think about what it is like to change your gender or change actually this, the, your body. Actually, not the gender, but your body from male to female or female to male. So it allows you to play a character who sheds his skin to turn into another body. And what that ha what happens to your thinking when you go through that transformation, okay? It's a very complex game. I, I mean, I would recommend that for, for college students, really. Um, the material is more graphic, um, but that is showing you range, okay? It's not again we have this misconception that games are supposed to be for children the truth is majority of, of game players are between what 35 to 40 <laughs> that's from the ESA report right now the majority of them are, are between that age um, and also more than 50 percent of players right now are female so these issues you know deep complex issues are appearing in games as themes okay and also there are some concessions made to allow games to speak to the female experience, at least they're trying. But the idea is that we can see through the game and also through, through for, for example, getting your students to create interactive fiction, how much richer the reading material will be if you accompany that with a book, like what our uh, track two uh, facilitators have done, right? Pairing Joseph Campbell with uh, uh, WOW, so you can understand what Joseph Campbell is talking about by visually seeing it and playing the game. Okay, so I think I'll pass it back to Chris. Okay, hi. Um, so for what we did for track two is the multi is we did Lee Sheldon's the multiplayer classroom, and the reason why we did this is we get lots of questions about. Um, gamification and I want to gamify my class and oh tell me quick steps that I can do we think that Lee Sheldon has done with the, with the multiplayer classroom has done the best job when it comes to really thinking out something like gamification and reading his book you really get the idea of the depth and the psychology that goes into it that you normally don't get if somebody's giving you a, a Google Doc that has has stars and and what they're calling badges on it. So um, we decided to read Lee Sheldon's book. We did we did three weeks we did three weeks of it, and what we and what we did with that is we really discuss the different parts. We really discuss the different parts of it, and to make it a little more fun, um, Cam or Christina Tone set up Chore Wars for us. And if anybody has a screen that they can go on Chore Wars real quick, that that would be most welcome. Um, but what Chore Wars is is actually a gamification system. It's absolutely free. It was only it was only set up for um, going ahead and doing chores. 
And what ended? Oh, and thank you, Tanya, for putting it up. But it has all the it has all the different <laughs> features that you would normally have in a game. You can have the different characters. You have different characteristics. You you have to come up with an avatar and an avatar name, and you get experience points, and you can do levels. So we paired the multiplayer classroom. Um, with chore wars, so that people could go ahead and and play some quests while while we were reading the book, and it was funny because people would finish the different educators that were with us would finish the quests and then would end up um, going ahead and asking us for more because they were finished already. Um, we also went into some um, MMOs like World of Warcraft again to show some examples and we really found that that doing the book club this way really helped us that we not only read about certain things but then we also played the games and we could go back and, and we could talk about the experiences so um, where we're going now is to um, where 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 we currently are. We're in the second week of our fourth book club, and it is Ready Player One. And we're gonna we're gonna go over to Trish to so she can tell you uh, so she can go ahead and tell you why we chose Ready Player One. Okay. Yeah. We chose Ready Player One because it is pretty much one of the most classic games uh, books that is about video games, and it is a, it's a YA novel, but which means young adult. Um, but every adult that I've known who've read it has really, really enjoyed it. Um, there are tons and tons of references to the 80s when most of us were either older children, teenagers, or in our 20s. And it is filled with references to the video games that are considered the classics of the, the games that were in arcades and a lot of games that are still being played now. Um, speaking of Zork, uh, which is in the internet one of the considered the first interactive fiction game. Um, and all through this are references to the foods from the 80s, to cars from the 80s, um, movies, music, and for anyone who reads this book, it's truly a trip down memory lane. So this is one that we've heard there's a movie coming out, but it's also, the book takes place primarily in a virtual environment, sort of similar, it would be like World of Warcraft on steroids. It is a fully immersive environment with all the bells and whistles that some of us who play in those kind of games kind of go, oh, that would be really nice to be able to do that. But it's also, it's showing you somewhat of the darker side of it. But it has been an incredibly fun read. And so far, we know that Wade, who is the main character, he goes by the character, his character's name is Parzival, which is a play on the name Percival from the Knights of the Round Table. And he is a senior in high school, and he lives in a truly dystopian environment. Pretty much the United States has been destroyed environmentally by uh, wars and lack of fuel and it's polluted, it's dirty and it's overcrowded and there's an energy crisis and either you have or you have not. There seems to be a lot of uh, extreme poverty or extreme wealth but the one thing everyone does have is access to the Oasis, which is a virtual environment that was created by a video game developer named James Halliday. And in this environment, everyone has access to the Oasis. It is a free virtual environment where there are areas that are PVP, which is, means player versus player. There are areas that are um, 
non-magic where you can't use any kind of magical spells or anything and then there's areas where it's anything goes and you can do anything as far as uh, weapons and magic and you can battle so there's they've created an environment for everyone and in this world there are places that Halliday remind, rem remembers fondly from when he was a kid and there are recreations of movies like The Breakfast Club and War Games and you can go in and act out the movie but what has gone on is Halliday has died and he has left an, an Easter egg which is a hidden surprise or treasure within the game and the job that he gave the challenge he gave everyone is if you find this Easter egg you will inherit the oasis you will get everything and so now there is a huge battle going on with all these people who've become gunters which are the people who are looking for the Easter egg and these people have researched for years and years and years trying to delve into the deepest bits of Halliday's autobiography and anything written about him and they know him and they know the Oasis like the back of their hand and there are riddles and they're trying to solve the riddles of how to get to the Easter egg and in this process Wade has a couple of friends and one of whom kind of becomes a romantic interest and they are trying to find that first Easter egg and they did they find it on the the planet that is the school that Wade goes to he is the first one who gets through the first gate and from that point on it's like the place goes crazy and when we stopped last week uh, the bad guys which is the um, they call them the Sixers and they call them another name too called the suckers I think they are um, they have just tried to bribe Wade into working with them to where he would guide them to the Easter egg and what has ended up happening is that Wade kind of called their bluff on a threat that they made and what they did is they blew up the trailer where all of Wade's relatives were and now he is completely with no family and so essentially his family are the friends that he has within the Oasis H and Artemis and Dato and Shoto which are all the four of them are in the top positions for the Easter egg he has no clue about the second clue to get to the next gate and when we stopped last week he had left and he had gone to Columbus Ohio to hole up to continue his quest for the Easter egg so that's where we are right now and do you want me to continue oh no no actually Grid, <laughs> could you tell us something about the game and the game that we're playing that we're, we're currently playing now to get people I should say what in the mood <laughs> okay so on my screen we have the um, the site for the game Ingress and as Trish was talking about this the, the protagonists friends who are people he he never met he doesn't know whether they're really male or female or how old they are what race they are or anything about them but they are his friends and when we play this game Ingress it's kinda of one of the interesting things about it it is an augmented reality game you have to walk around to play it and so you're a little bit in the real world and then you're a little bit in this game so um, you basically there's two sides you know and it it doesn't really matter which side you pick but there's the blue side and then there's the green side and uh, you walk around your community or a community that you're visiting and you what they call hack portals you basically claim area as your own and it, it's a little bit of a process to do this you know basically tapping buttons um, on your on your mobile device but you're moving around and there are sites that are re relatively permanent um, cemeteries tend to be really good places to have a lot of portals um, but 
uh, post offices, banks, historic buildings, statues, um, college campuses are another place that seem to have a lot of portals. And it's interesting when you visit certain areas, they're very, very blue, and then you visit other areas um, that, that are much more green. But I guess that I kind of wanted to share the <laughs> this screen that I have. This is kind of what it looks like on your on your uh, cell phone or your mobile device. These happen to be blue areas that have been captured. So as you walk around, you you capture this area or you hack this area. You get gear, and as you get more advanced in your play, you interconnect with other people. And we are interconnecting as we play this game. We don't know who the other people are. I mean, it's kind of interesting, but I, I'm looking forward to the time when you can actually communicate with these other people and find out, you know, they do have events. Ingress has live events where people get together. But I think that the idea from from the book as well as, the, as uh, so many games is that you are playing with people, real people, from other places who who may be very different than you, but you're playing the same game and you have the same goal, and you work together to achieve that goal. And that whole idea is pretty fascinating. That, that happens in pretty much all MMOs. And that's my thing on Ingress. No, that's that's real. That's really good. And and the thing about it is, the idea is we're pairing a game again with the book and the reason we're pairing the game is so that you can have an idea you you can visually see and and get the feeling of playing it along with reading the book it's not just reading about the game it's also it's also looking at it. now we'll turn it over to Chris to tell you about an individual game that we're, we're playing inside of inside of the book club so nobody else besides the book club people are playing this Sure, and uh, first I want to say is, uh, so this piece is called The Faux Oasis, and uh, I want to thank Matthew Winner and the Level Up Book Club for, they started, uh, they did Ready Player One before us, and, and this is sort of a piece that, that they had, and uh, that we've been able, they've uh, been willing to share with us, and so we've incorporated it as well. Uh, so Christina is sort of our game master for this, uh, so uh, she's the only one that knows all the answers. Uh, and uh, and she's been she does try to give hints as you can see here. Uh, there's four that are, there have been four different modules and put out. There'll be seven total. So an example of what's up there is so this is the latest one uh, that's out there. So you can see it starts with directions, then it starts you off. Says four score and seven minutes ago, we, your forefathers, were brought forth upon a most excellent adventure conceived by our new friends Bill and. <gasps> it's been omitted. These two great gentlemen are dis are dedicated to pro to a proposition which was true in my time, just as it is true today. Be excellent to each other and party on, dudes. Uh, and then basically, you have little hints of, of of filling things out. So different pieces are. Uh, Omitted, so it's not always just fill in the blank. Uh, some other pieces that we've had is beyond the Goblin City. Sarah spoke. You have new power over me. This is this word too obscure for thee, George Lucas. There's a first time for everything. So, um, and then basically the question we have to answer is what has been done with the elephant. <gasps> so this is the Foasis. So we have a lot of things going on. Uh, it is set up just like the leaderboard in uh, Ready Player One, in that the first person to get it gets 10,000 points, and then everyone who answers it afterwards, it gets to drop down 1,000 points as, as people go through. So you can see there, there's a leaderboard going on. We're up to 11 people, so anyone can grab it. The other thing is, is that uh, there are four modules, so you can, you can answer them outside of order if you want. If you find some easier than others, go for those first. Again, the faster you turn them in, the more points you get. And uh, so really it helps, it helps get everyone in the mood for playing what we're seeing. Okay, and, and basically what we're showing you there is something like Chore Wars, where we've created some, where we're using, and I shouldn't say create because Matthew Winner did this, and we want to thank him for letting us use it, but that, that we're using a game that parallels what's happening 
inside the book. Inside the book, you have to solve these riddles and get keys. And trust me, we've been seeing it. People have been putting it in our Google Plus community where we put discussions about, oh, I hate this one. Oh, what's the clue? And things like that. And it's the same kind of thing that, that's happening that's happening in the book that was written, looking for these certain keys. So again, we're mirroring this so that that our educators who are reading it can understand and get the same feeling that the main character has. That frustration, that struggle, that having to go everywhere on the internet to look for the clues. We're, we're doing all this. And then just to end it up, as if that wasn't enough for this time, we're also doing the dystopian arcade. Now, the dystopian arcade, this was really designed by John Spike. And he's done this in um, high school English class where he has the students not only reading dystopian literature but then also playing dystopian uh, the dystopian games so that he can he can go ahead and do this and and I'm going to turn it over to, to Sherry for a moment so she can she just type something in about dystopian literature and 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 she knows more about this than I do so I'm going to turn it over to her okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> um I just want to uh, commend John for the, the, the concept there with the dystopian arcade. Um, the, the, the games that he chosen are, are very apt and very appropriate for the discussion what a dystopia is. And the origin, um, as I was just making a note of it, is that the origin of the term, actually dystopia, came from cacophotopia, and that is from philosopher Jeremy Bentham. And the term, the actual meaning of the term is that it's a place of opposite to utopia. And he merely created that term to basically critique government systems at, in his time. So he's saying, here's a version of a utopic government, and here's a version of a cacotopia, cacotopic government. Okay. Later on, the term dystopia, you know, uh, Mills picked it up and, and uh, turned the term into dystopia, and that's why we use dystopia more. But basically, you know, some of the themes, you know, you have a, a problematic government of bad living conditions, dictatorship, totalitarianism, you know, uh, living conditions are not ideal. So when we say dystopia, it has a very specific meaning. And in terms of, for example, futurism, it really is talking about the idea that the individual is disconnected from greater society, that we feel like individuals are not connected. So when you say something is dystopian, I mean, it sounds cool, but really what you're saying is we are disconnected from each other. And as you can see, there are some implication of that uh, as people are starting to get more disconnected with the physical reality but um, some people will argue that we're more connected via virtual reality so that's another discussion okay the another game um, both of the games that I've used I used papers pleased actually I used three games um, every day the same dream as well as the Republic of Times in my classes uh, for several years now and what I liked about Every Day the Same Dream is that it's a play, it's a demonstration of uh, Frederick Nietzsche's um, theory of the eternal recurrence. And eternal recurrence is actually, this concept has been appearing throughout history. Um, Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, it's the idea that the world is cyclical, that time is cyclical. So everything goes in circles. And without giving the whole game away, you are going to feel frustrated when you play this game. The idea is that what can you do, what choices can you make to alter the timeline if everything is cyclical, okay? So that's what every day the same dream is. And if you're interested, you should also take a look at Henri Poincaré's uh, uh, recurrence theorem, okay? That's from physics, but it's also related to those games. So you can see, even though the games, they look fun, but I apply, just like many other educators, to harder concepts. And Republic of Times is obviously a demonstration of what a totalitarian, what a newspaper will look like if it's governed by a totalitarian government, okay? So I definitely recommend playing those. And half Life's fun, too. So back to Kay. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to try and wrap it up. We, we thought we could somehow squeeze in the, this week's discussions and an overview, and, and it's not working out. So I'm just going to take this last part and show you what, we, what we, we normally do. When we do these Hangouts, what we normally do is, is an overview, and Trish did a good, pretty good overview 
already ready player one and then we go into these discussion <laughs> questions and th this is the one for for this week um, and our, our first discussion question and we do these in Google um, our Google community and then we also use the Google Hangout and when we have more time all we do is the discussion questions, but instead I'm just going to go over them. For, for, the, for our first discussion question for this week, and we'll keep it up because, you know, because we didn't get a chance to do <laughs> this hangout, is um, what if students had to do a simulation instead of a test? How would this change the way we teach? And that's our first discussion question this week, and it's really because there was a line uh, in Ready Player One that says, finish the quest by taking the test. So our first discussion question this week is is um, inspired by that. Unfortunately, we can't talk about it, so we'll just go to the second discussion question. And this is relate and this is relating to at this point at this point in time. Um, and Sherry asks, "What if you're taking a test inside a simulation?" Exactly. And aren't and and uh, well, we don't have time to discuss this. Aren't all games and simulations actually tests that assess something? Yeah. But look, we, we won't take the time to do that here. Our second one comes from, at this point, Wade is really trying to do everything in the game. And so he's going, he's putting on his visor, he's putting on his haptic gloves all the time. And so our, our, our other part of this discussion is how close are we to this, to the virtual reality life and also the quantified self. And quantified self is a is a term that we're talking about more as we all run around with Fitbits and everything like that, counting all these numbers and our heartbeats and how much we sleep and stuff like that. And now our third discussion question for this week is, okay, we've read two-thirds of the book. What are the socioeconomic themes? How does this stack up to what we're, if we were to pull up today's media? And what other dystopian literature have you read and how have you presented in your classroom? So that's our third question. So you can see, we're reading the book, <laughs> we're playing the game, but then we become teachers when it becomes discussion questions, okay? We're, we're not really talking about Wade's, you know, um, pseudo-romance. Um, we're, we're talking about about really what's coming out of this book that's that's giving us prompts and making us a think as teachers. Okay, so to wrap it up, and we're going to go through this quickly. Other dystopian cool literature out there, <laughs> as you can see, Ready Player One, Hunger Games, so popular now. But Blade Runner, Logan's Run, The Stand, and we'll skip to the next slide because we have to end quickly. Um, we're going to continue playing the Foasis. So even if you're not in the book club yet, you can still play the Foasis with us. Um, just go in there and start working on the clues, and you can go through the same struggle as as the main character and the the other characters in our book are going through. Um, Ingress, play Ingress. It doesn't matter which side you pick, green or blue. Okay, frogs or Smurfs. It's the idea of going and running around and having this idea of being on another faction, about looking for these things, going in the world and looking for clues and following this. Again, it's part, it's part of what are, we're doing um, for our week three readings. These are just, we're play, it's level three. These are just the pages. <laughs> and we go over that before we leave. Um, interactive fiction. We are going to adding one game this week. And go ahead, and this is a game that Sherry found for us, <laughs> and it's called Secret Net. And <laughs> and the thing about it is, it, I took a screenshot of the first screen. It looks very much like any kind of hacker movie, or or CIS cyber, or or you know, or scorpions, or anything else that you're looking at right now. So we put that up for you to play. And then the dystopian arcade is still going to be up there. And then we are going to, okay, so our main purpose in the last two minutes that we have, here's the thing. We are trying to get you to play games, one, so you understand where the learning happens. So two, you understand where the assessment in the game happens. 
Okay, and three is to, is we want you to get from even the level of playing games to the next level. And this is something Sherry came up with that that you are looking at designing games, or that you're looking your, at yourself being that dungeon master or that game master who controls it. Because here's the thing, we we want you to be fluent in games. Okay, we don't want you just lurking. Okay, so to we're going to end it up now. So any last words from anybody? Let's play. <laughs> okay, then, then thank you, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>